A founding member of the Medellin cartel, Rodriguez Gacha was one of the most industrious and powerful drug traffickers in the history of narcotics. Welcome to Nutty History, and today, let's find out the untold story of Rodriguez Gacha, or as his peers called him, El Mexicano. Gacha was born Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha on May 14, 1947, in a town called Pacho in Cundinamarca. And no, the town of Pacho has nothing to do with Cali Cartel's Pacho Herrera. Gacha's parents were a humble peasant couple who earned their living by raising pigs. The financial situation of the family played a part in Gacha's decision to not pursue formal education after grade school. In the early 1970s, young Gacha moved to Mutso, Boichaca. Boichaca back then was the center of emerald exploitation in Colombia, and Gacha found just the right plan to work. Gilberto Molina, Gacha's new boss, was known as the Tsar of Emeralds. Gacha joined the Emerald Smuggling Group as security for Molina himself. Before Gacha turned 25 years old, he had gained a fearsome reputation as Molina's ice-cold hitman. Being a killer helped Gacha to jump ranks in Molina's organization as Molina was in dire need of ruthless soldiers like him for the Green War. The Green War is not always talked about. But since the 1970s, Colombia had been suffering from a series of civil wars between left-wing guerrillas, right-wing paramilitary, drug lords, and the government itself. The war in the 1970s started because of an armed dispute between two cartel-like groups. One was led by Victor Carranza, and the other was the Rincon clan, which soon became an all-out civil war called the First Green War. Multiple groups were involved, trying to gain ownership of the emerald mines of Colombia. The Colombian government would try to seek an agreement with mining concessions in an attempt to take the business away from the mafias and legalize emerald exploitation. Molina and Gacha aligned themselves with Victor Carranza during this conflict. Their partnership allowed them to gain control of a large mine as Carranza managed to negotiate the end of the First Green War. Soon, Molina and Carranza became the beneficiaries of the mine concessions after the approval of the Colombian government. This allowed both mafias to legalize their immense riches and consolidate their power. And to think Michael Corleone couldn't achieve the same thing in three movies. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Meanwhile, Gacha was cooking up something new for himself and Molina in Medellin. By the time the first Green War came to an end, Colombia's blood emeralds were not the hottest Colombian product in the market. A new czar had carved his kingdom in Colombia, and his empire was made of white powder instead of green gemstones. Pablo Escobar and his associates were building a new drug empire that was far more profitable and was going to change the history of Colombia forever. Gacha was introduced to the drug trade by a lady named Veronica Rivera de Vargas. Veronica was known as the Queen of Coco in Colombia. Veronica vanished from the drug scene during the late 80s after being captured by the DEA. There isn't even a single photograph available of her for the public on the internet. But long before she said farewell to the Medellin cartel and the drug industry, Veronica introduced Gacha to the kingpin himself, Pablo Escobar. Gacha impressed Pablo Escobar with his industrious work and soon prospered. With his newly earned wealth, Rodriguez Gacha began buying large amounts of land in the middle Magdalena region in the valley, bordering the Antioquia, Boyacá, and Santander. Gilberto Molina at first was not approving of mingling with drug traffickers, and this caused a rift between the two close associates. Molina perceived Gacha's involvement in the Medellin cartel as an act of betrayal and removed Gacha from the control of Emerald Mines. Gacha responded with an attack at Molina's property in San Saimba. However, later both of them reconciled and Gacha invited Molina to join the drug trade, and this time Molina accepted. It was suspected that Molina provided helicopters and hangars for drug trafficking, and his ranch La Fortuna was used as a drug distribution center. Molina was also arrested on the allegations of owning a 200-acre cocoa plantation, but the narcotics charges were later dropped. During the late 1970s, Gacha rose in the Medellin cartel for finding new traffic routes through Mexico to reach U.S. cities like Los Angeles and Houston. To do so, he created relationships with the Mexican cartels, specifically Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. With the aid of Gacha, the Medellin cartel was trafficking narcotics through Mexico, Haiti, and Nicaragua. 
One of Gotcha's prominent pilots was Barry Seal, who was portrayed by Tom Cruise in the Hollywood blockbuster movie known as American Made. Following the success, Gotcha purchased a string of farms in his hometown in the locality of Pacho, with Mexican-inspired names such as Cuernovaca, Chihuahua, Sonora, and Mazitlan. He also set up Tranquilandia, which was one of the largest and best known of the Medellin cartel's jungle laboratories. More than 2,000 people lived and worked in this lab, making and packaging Colombian snow. His connections with Mexicans, coupled with an infatuation with Mexican culture, music, and their style of speaking, earned him the name El Mexicano among his peers. As he became one of the main capos of the rising cartel, Rodrigo Scacha started having problems with the FARC guerrillas. The insurgent army was taxing some of his cocoa plantations and also robbing Gacha's men. These left-wing militias were supported by the Patriotic Union Party, and as the friction between Gacha and the guerrillas turned bloody, everybody on the other side faced Gacha's unhinged wrath. Gacha had made so much money by now that he had hired Israeli and British mercenaries to train teams of assassins and his own fleet of the paramilitary. These paramilitary groups were created with the support of the landowners and cattle ranchers who were fed up with left-wing guerrillas' act of marauding. When the FARC crossed paths with Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha, he had become the supreme commander of the narco-paramilitary of Colombia. With support and impunity from the right-leaning government, Gacha hit him hard with vengeance and fury. About 800 members of the Patriotic Union Party were killed by Gacha's men. Jaime Pardo Leal, the president of the Patriotic Union Party, was assassinated on October 12, 1988. Gacha didn't spare any peasants who sympathized with leftist guerrillas either, and sponsored many massacres of poor people who were connected with left-wing militias in any form. Gacha had his fingers in other operations of the Medellin cartel too. Throughout the 1980s, Rodriguez served as a catalyst for the Medellin cartel's explosive rise to power by financing the importation and implementation of expensive foreign technology and expertise. He was also engaged in the bloody gang war between the Medellin and the Cali cartel. And he didn't forget about the emerald mines either. Gacha twisted every arm to get a share of bloody emeralds as a new green war broke out after Molina's assassination. Nineteen eighty nine brought a lot of changes in the political scene for the USA and Colombia. Presidents of both countries were under immense pressure to combat the rampant narcotics problem. President George H. W. Bush was a newly elected president who was facing the challenge of increasing drug usage and drug related violence plaguing American cities. In Colombia, President Virgilio Barco Vargas was losing his popularity. His distaste for publicity and reluctance to make public appearances had left many people calling him the ghost president. So, it was quite surprising that when the USA confronted him over the government of Colombia's ignorance toward the drug cartels, the 67-year-old civil engineer president surprised everybody by formulating a ferocious attack on the whole Medellin cartel. Colombian military called it Operation Apocalypse. Under pressure from Washington to cut the flow of narcotics from Colombia to the US, President Vargas ordered raids on processing laboratories and jungle airfields. This was a direct threat to Gacha, who had a prize of 500 million pesos on his head. To add to his woes, he got the news of his son being arrested for illegal possession of weapons in Bogota. The Colombian government was hoping by keeping his son arrested, they would put pressure on Gacha to do something stupid and reckless, but Gacha was too smart for stuff like that. But something unexpected happened. El Navegente, one of the most loyal henchmen of Gacha, turned on him and snitched Gacha's location in Cartagena to authorities. Gacha was chased to his El Tercero property where two helicopter gunships landed to end the reign of El Mexicano in Colombia. After intense shooting, Gacha attempted to escape, but his leg was wounded. Gacha and his son Freddy were shot at the same time, and authorities found their bodies next to each other. Two days later, his body and that of his son were buried in his hometown in the middle of a mass funeral. Many in his village saw him as a benefactor of the poor and a kind man. Others saw him as a savage whose luck had run out. According to Forbes magazine, El Mexicano Gacha was one of the richest men of his time. He was the owner of more than 100 properties, farms, houses, apartments, plots, and vehicles that were valued at 40 billion Colombian pesos. Not only was he into real estate, but the man invested in football as well. It is not a secret that as a football fan and a supporter of Millonarios FC, he was the biggest investor of this team. 
financing the hiring and salaries of the players. The article also claimed that he bought several championships in favor of his team. What can we say? The man loved winning. So, what do you think? Did Gotcha deserve the grand funeral that he got? Or does a criminal like him not deserve posthumous respect? Tell us in the comments. And if you'd like to watch more videos about the Medellin cartel, check out these videos on the screen. And thanks for watching Nutty History.